So today we're joined by someone that I have been dying to meet. That's actually quite nervous to meet. So, and no wonder, considering some of the quotes attributed to him, every successful, successful emancipation struggle is a collective one. Every true emancipation struggle is for the sake of the individual. And if that doesn't sound much like church, then he also said, the only liberation struggle worth fighting is a struggle inspired by love. Love is the beginning, middle, and end of liberation. Without love, there can be no liberation worthy of the name. He helped to form the first Pride March, 45 years ago, I know, has tirelessly fought for human rights here and around the world, and as I've probably mentioned, is one of my personal heroes. So please help me to welcome Peter Tatchell. Hello, Peter. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> So I, um, I have some questions, and I'm going to ignore the first one, and, and, ask, and ask you about um, the celebrations that are going on right now for the decriminalisation of homosexuality. Fifty years ago, at least the partial decriminalisation. Um, what do you think about all the celebration and everything that's going on right now? Well, of course, it is quite right that the momentous 1627 Act is celebrated. Uh, and it was definitely progress. It ended life imprisonment for same-sex relations. And it did, within certain narrow confines, end criminalization. But most of the aspects of life concerning gay men and bisexual men still remain criminal. So it was a very partial, limited, narrow decriminalization. And in fact, in the seven years after 1967, the convictions of gay and bisexual men rose by over 400%. Wow. And in the period from 1967 until 2003, when the anti-gay laws were finally abolished, because they remained on the statute books after 67, but when they were finally abolished in 2003, in that period from 67 to 2003, at least 15,000 gay and bisexual men were convicted of consenting adult same-sex behaviour. And of course, the end of criminalisation didn't happen in Northern Ireland until 2008, and it didn't take effect in Scotland until 2013. So it's, it's a very mixed feeling, and I suppose I feel a certain sense of frustration, even anger, at the way it has been um, largely portrayed as the end of criminalization or a, a full decriminalization, which is not at all the way it was. Um, I don't know if some of you may have listened to my Archive on Four program last night on Radio 4, uh, the myth of homosexual decriminalization was an attempt to tell the story of what happened after 1967 and gave some really poignant examples of men who suffered terribly uh, as a result including one man who was a victim of the last great police witch hunt, which is in 2013, not 1913, <laughs> 2013, uh, when police all over England swooped on gay men who'd been convicted in the 40s, 50s, and 60s to demand they give their DNA for a database of, quote, serious sexual and violent offenders. They were put on that register alongside rapists and child sex abusers. And the only way it was stopped was because of the negative publicity that I generated and those men speaking out. And eventually, out of pure embarrassment, the police halted that witch hunt. But it shows that it's, it's, a, it's a very mixed message and a very mixed, I have very mixed feelings about, about the celebrations. And I, I reflect on it, I think to myself, I don't want to be, I'm not blaming all straight people at all, but, you know, basically, history is straight history. Yeah. Um, and they wrote our history for us, and now they're rewriting it again. So I think in the late 70s, um, a lesbian mother uh, who was married, her husband discovered she was having an affair with a woman and brutally murdered her, a really savage, premeditated murder. He was convicted, but the judge in the trial said, you have suffered a grave prosecution, uh, a, gra a grave um, provocation, a grave prov provocation. 
And so he passed a sentence of 12 months in prison. The guy got out after six months. Um, you know, equally in, in the early 1990s, uh, same-sex couples, both male and female, were being arrested for merely holding hands, giving each other a good night kiss at a bus stop, um, things like that. Using the Public Order Act, which was origi originally introduced in 1986, to combat football hooliganism and street rioting. Uh, they, were, they were caught under this catch-all behavior like <laughs> cause harassment, alarm and distress. So it is, it is a there are mixed feelings and emotions about it. Mm. Those of us who are LGBT have probably experienced discrimination at some level. Um, but I know we're not the only people to suffer discrimination. If you're, if you're a Muslim right now, mm. then, then, um, then there's a lot of uh, discriminatory behavior around, um, around being Muslim. I think to be LGBT and Muslim must be especially difficult because of the way that that Islam often sees sexuality. I remember you were doing, you, you had started the LGBT Muslim Solidarity Campaign. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that, please? The thinking behind that campaign was to try and build bridges between the LGBT and Muslim communities on the basis that both communities experience prejudice, discrimination, and hate crime. So obviously there are differences, but surely we should be able to work together around combating the hate that damages both communities. Um, you know, we need to challenge some of the anti-Muslim prejudice that exists in the LGBT community. And likewise, we certainly need to challenge the often quite extreme homophobia that exists in sections of the Muslim community. And so this campaign was really an attempt to do that, and it was on the basis of appeals to me from Muslim LGBT people who said, no one is doing anything about the suffering we're enduring. Now, I do think it is truly shameful that most LGBT organizations in this country will not address the plight of LGBT Muslims because they fear they're going to be branded as racist or Islamophobic. That's a real betrayal of probably the most vulnerable section of our community. And it is not Islamophobic, and it's certainly not racist, to defend LGBT Muslims who are being um, thrown out of their homes by their parents, who are being beaten up on the street by gangs, who are being banned from attending the local mosque, which some of them may have been attending for 10, 20 or 30 years. That's not anti-Muslim. That's defending Muslims. And you're anti-Muslim if you don't stand in defense of LGBT Muslims. But, you know, we've had very little success in terms of getting any significant Muslim organization or um, mosque to do anything about this. You know, we've tried, I think, 11 times in the last two years to get the East London Mosque to host a meeting, a dialogue between the LGBT and Muslim communities and to meet with LGBT Muslims. Point blank, they just will, will not do that. They will not do that. Um, and it does show that there really is a problem there. We're not asking them to say, you know, homosexuality is great and we support it. We'd love them to do it, but we're not expecting that. But surely, as people of faith, they should be opposed to hatred and discrimination and the kind of violence that is visited upon LGBT Muslims. Um, to give you an example, um, a couple of years ago we had uh, a young Muslim man who had been forced out of his home by his parents. He got his own flat in Whitechapel in East London. And then his neighbors discovered or suspected that he was gay and began a campaign of you know, really vile harassment, verbal threats, um, having objects thrown at him, having his windows smashed. Uh, life became absolutely intolerable. He got no support from the police and no support from the local council because they said, quote, this is a sensitive issue. We mustn't alienate the Muslim community. <coughs> so he was allowed to suffer in the name of some absurd parody of political correctness. And, um, you know, it was people like him that motivated us to do this campaign. Um, one of the actions we did subsequent to that was we organized a leafleting in Whitechapel area, uh, which has got a quite significant, substantial Muslim population, uh, where we hand out leaflets, you know, about the LGBT Muslim Solidarity campaign 
um, specifically targeted Muslim shoppers going about their business and, and people coming out of the tube station. And the responses were very interesting. Probably about 20% of the Muslim people we engaged with said things like, I'm Muslim and I support LGBT rights. Yeah, it's okay to, I, I accept Muslims who are gay, it's their choice, it's their right. 20% were very hostile. They said, you can't be gay and be Muslim. No, of course, gay people shouldn't have any rights at all. Things quite, quite, some were even much more aggressive. And then the other 60%, well, it was just impossible to tell their reactions. They kept very, very, very quiet and very, um, you keep it all close to their chest. Now, you could say, well, 20%, that's not very good. <laughs> true, true. But it's more than you might have got 10 or 15 years ago. And these people did actually verbalize it to us in the street in front of other Muslims all around them. So I was sort of, at one level, disappointed, but at another level, quite heartened. <coughs> Um, um, so I've, I know that a number of LGBT organizations like uh, Stonewall, the LGBT Foundation, and of course uh, the Peter Thatcher Foundation are focusing on um, sex and relationship education in schools. Why? Why at this point focus on that? Well, I think we've all been focusing on it for quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but of course, what is brought to a head is that the Education Committee of Parliament uh, had for a number of years recommended that sex and relationship <coughs> education should be mandatory in every school, whatever its status, and that it should include information about LGBT <laughs> issues in order to combat prejudice and bullying and in order to give young LGBT kids confidence and you know, affirm their sexuality and gender identity. Um, you may know that earlier this year the government agreed that they would make sex and relationship education mandatory in every school, although precisely on what terms is still rather vague, but they did not agree that those lessons should include LGBT issues. Um, so we feel that having got the sort of halfway in the door, we need to keep on pushing and make sure, and it's very interesting just in the last couple of days, Nick Gibb, the new Equalities Minister, has indicated that he intends to look at ways of making sure that LGBT education in schools is uh, made mandatory. Mm -hmm. Now, when and how and what that will involve, we've yet to see, but that's, that's a hopeful sign, but not before time, mm -hmm. not before time. And the thinking behind this, of course, is that no child is born bigoted. Prejudice is learned behavior. You know, no child comes out of the womb you know, with bigoted ideas. That you get that off parents, other adults around you, other kids at school, and so on. So if we can tackle not just homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia, but racism, misogyny, uh, prejudice against disabled people and people with uh, other um, mental and physical disabilities, um, you know, I think we can not eliminate, but definitely reduce the level of prejudice. And I think that's really, really important. And we know that where these kinds of lessons has been, have been tried in some countries, they do work. The level of bullying in school goes way down. The level of hate crime on the streets goes way down. So we're also trying to link up with you know, other organizations, women's organizations, black and ethnic minority groups, disability rights campaigners, um, ex-offenders groups, um, to try and create this, this consensus that we want these equality and diversity lessons across the board in every school to challenge all forms of prejudice. Some of us are parents, some of us are grandparents, some of us uh, have friends with children. What can we do to help, to help move things along? What kind of pressure can, can we apply or what can we say to our friends who have children uh, in order to, to help that process? Well, of course, that, that would have to happen at a legislative level. Right. The mandatory requirement would have to happen at the uh, government level in terms of law and all regulations. But um, all of you who are parents or know people are parents, you can you know, write to the local head of the school where your child goes. Uh, you can contact the chair of the school governors and ask what are they doing mm. to combat prejudice in the playground. Mm -hmm. um, we know that 
only about half of all schools have an anti-bullying program that explicitly addresses LGBT issues. Only half. That's really, really poor. And although some faith schools are okay, it seems with anecdotal evidence that levels of bullying are higher in faith schools and it's faith schools where the least action is taken to combat it. So quite clearly, work to be done. And you know, if you could do something simple like that, perhaps you can, in advance of government decision making, get your local school to take the right decision. Can I, can I ask a oh, sorry. Can I ask a question? Yep. Where's where's the resistance in your mind? What what's the main resistance in getting that um, part of the curriculum? Who 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 is behind the resistance or you know what? Well, I'm sure you probably know the Conservatives don't like state interference. Right. They're the anti state parties. They don't like the state dictating anything or regulating anything. They 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 want the free market to rule. So that's part of it. And then secondly, they're afraid of taking on religious schools. They think they fear the backlash from faith schools. And I think, you know, we just have to face down the fact that, you know, if schools are not giving young LGBT kids the right start in life, they are failing. And they can't use religion to hide behind that. I was doing some reading around some of the work that you're doing in the foundation, and I noticed that the majority of countries that are in the Commonwealth of Nations, and I was really quite surprised by this, uh, of course, formerly known as the British Commonwealth, still criminalise sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Now, next year, uh, we have the Commonwealth Summit in London. So does this affect kind of your approach to that and what we're doing? You're right. I mean, of the 52 member states of the Commonwealth, 36 still have a total prohibition on homosexuality. Um, some criminalise both male and female homosexuality. Um, seven of them have a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. So it's pretty grim. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's in complete defiance of the Commonwealth Charter. The Commonwealth Charter, which all member states have signed, affirms the principle of equal treatment, non-discrimination, equality and human rights for every Commonwealth citizen. So there's clearly a disjunction between what the Commonwealth says and proclaims and insists upon and what actually happens on the ground. And as you'll know, there are quite a few Commonwealth countries where things are going backwards. Mm -hmm. So the attempt to pass the Anti-Homosexuality Act in Uganda, well, it was passed, but then ruled out on a technicality, <coughs> but still the atmosphere in Uganda is toxic. Um, there are some very brave, courageous... Christian pastors who are speaking out, like Christopher Zinoncho, who of course paid with the terrible price of being expelled from or excommunicated effectively from the Anglican Communion. They even, he's 82 or 85, I can't remember, but they took away his pension. He said gay people are entitled to equal human rights, violence and discrimination is wrong. He was forced out of the Anglican Communion and they took away his pension. So he's living in you know, poverty, really. Um, and he's not the only one, there are others. Um, quite a few other uh, Anglican pastors and a couple of Catholic pastors who have had similar victimisation by their churches because they've defended LGBT human rights. Um, in Nigeria, you know, the draconian anti-gay law passed in 2013 not only criminalises any public display of affection but outlaws LGBT organisations, the funding of them, any events in support of gay rights, all totally legal now. Um, and you know Bangladesh, you know, heard about the two Agarit activists who were murdered by Islamist extremists about a year ago. So it's it, it it's really grim. And so we are lobbying the Commonwealth to say that after more than sixty years of Commonwealth summits, it is about bloody time they discussed LGBT rights. Um, I've been campaigning for nearly thirty years to get them to even discuss, not necessarily agree, but to discuss the issue, and they won't. They've always refused. Uh, only in 2011 that we had a Commonwealth Secretary General, Kamala Sharma, uh, who for the first time ever spoke out in defence of LGBT rights. No previous Commonwealth Secretary ever done it. And it took an Indian Commonwealth Secretary, rather than the succession of you know, English or New Zealand or whatever Commonwealth Secretary Generals, to do that. 
Um, what we're saying is that the Commonwealth should be committed to four very simple principles. First of all, the repeal of anti-gay laws, the decriminalization of homosexuality. Um, second, the uh, enforcement of anti-discrimination laws to protect LGBT people against discrimination. Uh, third, the enforcement of hate crime laws to protect us against violence. And fourth, consultation by Commonwealth governments with their local LGBT groups. Now, those are very four, you know, four very minimal demands. You know, they're not really huge asks. We're not asking any government to, you know, endorse homosexuality or promote it or you know, champion it or authorize pride parades or anything. It's just those four simple things, which are wholly consistent with both the Commonwealth Charter and, of course, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which all the Commonwealth countries have also signed. Um, I've just written to Baroness Scotland, the um, uh, British uh, Secretary General, the new one, um, suggesting that, well, uh, first of all, asking what is she going to do to make sure that LGBT rights are on the agenda after being shamefully excluded for six decades. And secondly, um, that she should do two things. One is organise an official forum as part of the formal Chugham agenda, Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting agenda, to host um, uh, events where prominent um, African and other Commonwealth uh, church leaders could speak out against homophobia and for decriminalization. So we've got the former presidents of Botswana and Mozambique have been very strong in saying that gay rights are human rights. There's Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, Christopher Sinonjo in uh, Uganda, and the um, Archbishop in Jamaica. They've all come out in favor of decriminalization. And I think for their voices to be heard in the Commonwealth would be far more powerful than any Western person. And we need those affirmations by, you know, black Christian people, because sadly there's often in the black Christian countries where the greatest homophobia exists. So the way to change that is to give a platform to those voices. And this ought to be doable. You know, there's, there's you know, at least two full days of formal deliberations. I'm sure they could find an hour in that schedule to have those speakers address the Commonwealth leaders. Another thing was also to have a, an, a second forum where the uh, leaders were addressed by grassroots activists, LGBT activists from different Commonwealth countries. So to hear the authentic LGBT voices from India, Pakistan, Nigeria, Uganda, and so on, that would be really, really powerful. Yeah. Uh, uh, Reverend Julian McCauley from House of Rainbows <coughs> is coming to chair some time with us next week before he flies out to Uganda, mm. where I think he's the Grand Marshal in the, mm. in the Pride Parade. Fingers crossed, everything everything works out. Mm. Um, but um, but yeah, it takes some real some real courage mm. to, to step out there on the front line, mm. especially when when the church is so actively hostile. It's mm. just yeah, it's unbelievable. Mm. Can I say on your courage and heroes? Um, when have you at the um, Pride in the Park yesterday? Mm -hmm. Did you see the video uh, that was played at about five o'clock on the main stage? No. Well, it's, it was made by Brighton Pride in 2014 about the global struggle for LGBT freedom. And I think it was one of the best, most moving and most powerful videos on the issue of the global fight for equality. Um, it's just a compilation of photographs of LGBT campaigners from all over the world. Probably, I don't know, maybe 200 or 250. Uh, just snapshots of different struggles and set to fantastic, brilliant music. Um, go on YouTube and just put in Brighton Pride 2014, I think you'll probably find it. But it really is worth it. And when you do find it, please share it with your friends because it, it really does show the awesome, really awesome courage and tenacity of people in countries where they are risking their lives 
and their liberty to defend LGBT rights. As a church, right from the beginning, we felt very called to support uh, LGBT, LGBT organizations. Um, and the, the main reason is, apart from the fact that many of us are LGBT, so have, have benefited from such organizations, is that um, to be an LGBT organization often disadvantages you in terms of funding, in terms of uh, applying for grants, in terms of, of being able to um, being able to apply in various places. I know that the Peter Tatchell Foundation kind of works on a shoestring. Tell us about how you managed to do that and how you do, I mean, I went on your website and looks at all the extraordinary work that you're doing right now, and I'm like, whoa, how do you, how do you deal with all that? How do you fund all that? With great difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> the funding is in inverse proportion to my notoriety. Um, <laughs> Well, the foundation wasn't set up by me. It was actually set up by friends of mine who had seen that I'd been working for, like, over 40 years, unfunded, no organization, no office, nothing. And they just felt there was a, if there was a formal structure there, it would help make me more effective and we could bring on more people to be involved. Um, sadly, we've never got the funding to really grow adequately. We've got, I have one assistant... Uh, Pliny Sukumani, who's from Mauritius. Um, I did have another, but she left to get a much higher, better paid job. Good luck to her, and she's, she's great. Um, so it's just me and him at the moment, although we're going to take on a fundraiser because, you know, so it, it's really, really, really tough. Um, we've been blocked from charity status three times by the Charity Commission. Uh, we're all kinds of obscure you know, unbelievable reasons. Um, you know, I think of organizations that I'd, I've helped get charity status, they just sailed through. Um, but I suppose it's because of the controversial history of my activism that they're really, there's someone in there or a group of people in there who really put the blocks on it. But we are now applying again. Um, and we've just had a whole series of new questions and interrogations which we have to answer. And I just... I'm getting more and more sceptical. I don't think we'll ever get it, to be honest. Um, they're just such, such... It's clear hostility there. Mm. They even sort of insinuated, not exactly, but sort of asking all kinds of questions about my personal finance. And there's, sort of, there's a sort of insinuation that I'm using this as a money-making exercise for myself, you know. Um, perhaps it wasn't intentional, but that's the way I read it. It was mm. quite, quite offensive. Mm -hmm. Anyway, well, we'll keep on battling and see what happens, but at the end of the day... Whether we get charity status or not, we'll, we, we, we'll, we will carry on. And, um, it is very difficult. I mean, I get between 1,000 and 2,000 messages and requests every day. And on the weekend, it only goes down to about six to 800. So trying to answer those is, like itself, an incredible mm -hmm. task. And it's just about killing me. I'm, I'm exhausted all the time because I'm living on three and four or five hours sleep just trying to get it. And these are, these are not rubbish. These, these are... Like today, I've had. Um, let me just. I, I haven't gone out this afternoon at all. I've been stuck with my friend in their, her, 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 her flat, just answering all these urgent emails. Um, uh, a, a person being um, beaten up and threatened, being killed because he's gay in Morocco. Um, a guy who appears to have suffered um, discrimination at his university because of his race. Um, then there's two or three asylum cases, um, Tanzania, um, Uganda, very, very frequent. Um, yeah, so it, it is completely overwhelming. Mm. And you know, even with Pliny's help, it's, it's not really possible to keep up. It's, it, 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 it is a real struggle. But we, we do. And you know, we do, if I may be permitted to say, as well as the public profile, I mean, we do about 250 individual cases a year, um, mostly victims of hate crime, discrimination, uh, and a lot of LGBT refugees. But we do, do straight, you know, uh, support straight people who are also victimized as well. Um, I got a really heartbreaking letter um, on Friday from a gay couple uh, in um, Cornwall, I think, yeah, no, Devon, Devon or Cornwall, I can't remember which. Um, they had been homophobically abused by their neighbours. Um, 
but not just abuse, you know, violent assaults and attacks. Right, they reported at the police, the police did nothing. And then they started getting evidence, and the perpetrators then turned around to say they had molested their son. Yeah. And so, unbelievably, one of these guys has just come out of two years in prison, and he's on the sex offenders register. Now, I don't know the full story, but reading that letter, I suspect that was the stitch up. Um, a similar, not a similar sort of case. It uh, happened also in Cornwall. Devon and Cornwall police are, are absolutely shameful in their treatment of LGBT people. There are some good officers, but overall they got a very, very bad record. Another couple, they had um, likewise been victimised by neighbours, or terrorised by neighbours, because they were gay. Um, again, the same thing happened. They reported to police. The perpetrators counter-accused them, not of paedophilia, but of being abusive, of um, you know, the, harassing them. Um, this went backwards and forwards for two years. The police did nothing. Did nothing, and eventually one of the guys had a heart attack and died. It was only then the police stepped in. So if you think homophobia is over, and you think it hasn't got deadly consequences, there's proof that it's, it's still a reality. So we do all that, plus all the campaigning as well. And um, you know, we're just, at the moment, supporting some Bangladeshi activists who are looking at bringing a legal case in the Bangladesh courts against the criminalization of homosexuality. Very, very brave, courageous people. Um, but we're giving them advice on how to prepare their case and the kinds of evidence and the, the case precedents that could be used. Like, as you know, there's a, not long ago a successful case brought in Belize where the courts in Belize overturned the ban on homosexuality. So we're doing all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah. more than we can possibly do. <laughs> and it's, it's painful to have to select, but, you know. Yeah. 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 I, I've got some of my cards here today. I think they're back on the table there, so if you're interested, please take one. Um, on the back on the green <coughs> strip, it tells you how you can sign up to receive the email bulletins. Totally free. Um, you know, please sign up and get your friends too. That way we establish a little human rights community, and from time to time, we send you things that you can do, lobbying MPs or whatever. Um, but a lot of the stuff we do is like quite below the radar, so... We did a big report about three or four weeks ago about women's rights in Pakistan, which is hardly reported in this country. And it was we got a researcher based at the University of Kent who's got contacts in Pakistan with women's rights campaigners there. And she just did this amazing, quite short, <coughs> succinct report, about maybe about 800 words, which just itemised the level of sexism and oppression that women face in Pakistan. Really, really powerful stuff. And then, of course, you know, just recently we did a report about the debunking the myth of decriminalisation in 1967. So we do a lot of quite original stuff. So I think you'll, I hope you'll find it interesting and useful. Peter, I hope that you'll hang around afterwards and have a cup of tea with us and yeah. have a chat, and, and then we can ask some personal questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need that. Yeah, steady on, steady on. <laughs> if anybody wants to ask a couple of questions now, I'd be happy to take them. Individual questions. Yeah. <laughs> Individual questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, you, you, uh, uh, at the beginning you talked about the Muslim community and you said that you couldn't find a mosque that would be willing to host. Um, have you found LGBT organizations that are, on the other side, willing to, to, to meet you? Because you originally said that you know, we're not doing anything as organizations. Are there any major organizations that have stepped forward and said that we will work with the Muslim community? No. I mean, I'm not saying that they are hostile to the idea, but it's just when you think about it, who are the most vulnerable members of our community? They're young trans kids, uh, they're people with uh, mental and physical disabilities, um, and they're Muslim and maybe sometimes Afro-Caribbean and African LGBT people mm -hmm. who don't have the love and support of their families, often face rejection by their faith communities, and often experience, you know, quite profound harassment and victimization. So I just asked the question is why doesn't the wider, bigger LGBT community do more for those particular 
vulnerable sections because we're not all in it together. You know, if you're well educated, white middle class with a professional job, it's not that you're totally problem free, but you're going to probably face less problems and you're going to have the resources and the knowledge to how to deal with them. And, you know, we just really have to realign things. And, you know, you know I, I, had, I get cases like, you know, this is just this is one example. This is about five years ago. I had a phone call from a young woman in tears. She was crying down the phone, sobbing down the phone. And eventually when she stopped crying, you know, she, she told her story. She said that she was Muslim and that her brother was gay and um, the parents found out. She didn't have a problem with it, but the parents found out. Um, they tricked her brother to go back to Pakistan where he was taken before a collection of the whole family and hacked to death with a machete. Oh, hacked alive. And, I mean, she was inconsolable, not just the fact that he was killed, but that she couldn't talk about it because she feared that she would be killed. This is unbelievable. This is in Britain just five, I think, five years ago. And I'm, that is exceptional. It's, it's not, that is not happening every day. But, you know, certainly there are more frequent threats to honor kill LGBT people. That is not completely uncommon. Um, and I just think, well, why isn't our community taking a stand? Why, why aren't mainstream LGBT organizations campaigning against the Islamist extremism that feeds that kind of mentality? You know, or, for example, you know, we had a call a while back from a young Muslim woman in East London who said, I don't want to wear the hijab, but I'm being threatened, by, not by her immediate family, by cousins and by the mosque, by people at the mosque and other neighbours. If you don't wear the mosque, we're going to get you. And she said, that means, you know, slashing with a knife or acid attack. Mm -hmm. So she said, I'm now wearing the hijab to protect myself, I don't want to wear it. What can I do? And of course, I, I couldn't have an answer. Because the police can't, even if the police did bother to protect her, they can't do it 24 hours a day. Um, so, you know, I just think, you know, we must take a stand against anti-Muslim prejudice and the kind of language, rhetoric and ideology of the EDL and Padiga and the BNP. We must take a stand against that. But that doesn't mean to say that we should be silent about the real genuine suffering that exists within sections of the Muslim community of people who don't conform to an orthodox Muslim line, whether they be women, LGBT, or members of minority Muslim sects like the Ahmadis. I mean, it's, it, again, where are the British human rights groups who are speaking out to defend Ahmadi Muslims in this country? There have been violent attacks upon Ahmadi mosques and Ahmadi shopkeepers and individuals in this country. Um, I can't remember, it was two years ago, um, the Ahmadi Muslims in Luton, which is one of the longest standing Ahmadi Muslim uh, communities in Britain, um, placed an advert, um, I think celebrating 150 years of being in Luton and 150 years of their mosque. The mainstream Sunni Muslim organizations were out absolutely apoplectic and uh, rage and outcry against this, that these were upper states, they were not true Muslims, and they demanded, that I think it was the Luton News, publish an apology for having carried that advert. And the Luton News did publish an apology. Wow. Mm. And I'm told, privately said, that they will never again ever give any publicity to Ahmadi Muslims. Mm. So, you know, um, can I... Can anybody remember any left-wing progressive liberal people speaking out against that? No. And this is not, this is not what humanitarian progressive politics is supposed to be about. You're supposed to stand with the oppressed. And, you know, I'm, I'm not religious, you know, I'm certainly not an Amadi Muslim, but when people of faith are persecuted, my instinct is to stand with them against their persecutors. Peter. 
Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.